Welcome everyone and those of you who are watching on our website or on Facebook, we want you to know that you're our honored guests. We're glad that you're here. These beautiful flowers this morning are given in memory of Mr. and Mrs. Ellis Murphy, memory of Walter Murphy, by Peg Barnett and the family. Please don't forget the great opportunities you have during the week. You can join us online uh, each Sunday morning at 9.30 of the Upper Room Sunday School class is on Zoom. And uh, Wednesday at noon, we have Lent with St. Francis, a uh, time of study and prayer. Wednesday night, if you'll look on the webpage there, you'll find a way to get to our Wednesday night program of worship, a regular program of music. Now here's the really good news. Uh, we will start worshiping together, live and in person here in the sanctuary starting Easter Sunday. But this is for those who have had their, evacu their vaccination shot for COVID. Uh, the rest of us will continue to worship online. So we're looking forward to that. We're happy about that. And what I hear from so many of you, you've already had your vaccination and are doing that the safe way. Let's worship together.
Let us pray. God of infinite goodness and mercy, we cannot escape your presence. Your promise remains with us in every situation. When we are desolate, your spirit comes to comfort us. Amid our tribulation, your chosen one remains our firm hope. We can sing your song in whatever land we find our abode. We shall forever give thanks for the gift of your grace. You are God who never forsakes us. To you be glory and praise now and forever. Amen. Old Testament lesson for today comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 21. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. 
So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. This ends our first reading. We have all types of joys and concerns, and we want you to think about those for a minute silently, and then we'll pray together. We thank you, God, that you are not exactly like us. People are creatures who often measure mercy in small amounts and create a vision of the nature of love according to our own parochial dimensions. We thank you that your kindness stretches on forever and that your life in Christ means that you have walked in our shoes so that nothing in our experience is going to shock you, O oh God. We thank you that you never turn your face away from us, but are always trying to touch us with the rays of joy. Shine your light, we ask you, O oh God, on this world. Send its brightness into every dark place that we may see those who need help and have dread and despair. Send it to the judgments of other people that they may grow to feel the warmth of human encounters and community. And always open our eyes to see as you see. Help us look at a world as a place of love and hope and change. And it can be that way. May we see others as you see them, as those who need your pardon, transforming spirit, and our companionship. Shine the entire light of your life on us here, we pray, that we may see ourselves more truly and know the love that you have so deeply for us. Give us hearts of thankfulness that we offer to all whom we meet something of the grace that you give to us every day. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, and we pray as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to John. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Today's gospel lesson is one in which we encounter the word light more than most. And when we read John, we remember that almost everything in it has two meanings. It's superficial surface meaning and it's deep symbolic meaning. But the word light sort of gives us trouble because we look at light as scientists do. Part particle, part wave, energy. But when we read the word light in John, one teacher has said perhaps you should use a substitute word. Instead of light, say, love our neighbor. It's a big concept of loving neighbor, the kingdom of God reality. So we need to remember that when we read about Jesus being the light. Let's pray. From the cowardice that dares not face new truth, from the laziness that is contented with half-truth, from the arrogance that thinks it knows all truth, good Lord, deliver us. Amen. The several stories and notions about Jesus' birth in the early church emphasize the fact that he was born at night. The shepherds, we read, were keeping their flocks by night. The wise men, night after night, followed the star in the dark. Herod's gloomy midnight counsels, counsels that all the children of Bethlehem were to be slain takes place, we think, at night. So the shining out of Jesus takes place clearly, literally, in the dark. Folks in the barber shop and elsewhere oftentimes tell me that we're living in bad times and they're only going to get worse. Well, this is not true at all. Now, we live in a world that has its troubles, but we also live in a world that has a lot of light. As Philip Brooks, the hymn writer, wrote about Bethlehem, Yet in thy dark straits shineth the everlasting light. Now John, or whoever was writing the Gospel of John, was writing about 90 years or maybe even 120 years after the Bethlehem birth event. And he was thinking about Jesus as a light shining in the darkness. Now John, no doubt, wrote his Gospel in the Gentile world. But even in that civilized Gentile world, there were gods and goddesses, many of them. There were gladiators killing each other. And by 90 AD, or we should say CE 90, the systematic oppression, persecution, and killing of Christians had gotten underway. And part of that is because they were no longer considered a sect of Judaism because around 90 AD, the synagogues decided to put Christians out of their organization. So there was, in a sense, more darkness in John's day than there was in Jesus' day. But the extraordinary thing about the Jesus event was that the light and liberation that comes from it, or was inherent in it, all the hosts of darkness have never been able to put it out. And we see even before his public life, Herod tried to put it out. Then later Caiaphas, Pilate. The Gospels are careful to mark these evil folks and mad endeavors in their attempt to put out the light. So more than once in the Gospels, there's great anxiety as the powers of evil seem about to quench the flame that was lit in Bethlehem. Now, as we go up in history, just about 700 years, I don't know if our camera person can get this, but by 732, Christianity had spread, and then it had shrunk down to a small area. And if you can't see that on the camera, it's a picture of some of Western Europe, 
down to Greece, Italy, and that was mostly it. The Moors had invaded from the west, the Ottomans from the east. Christianity was just a small section of Europe. Nowhere else in the world was monotheism accepted, believed, practiced. There was a large conquering army in southern France, and Christianity was about to be snuffed out, wiped off the face of the earth. And there was a man who organized all the French, the Franks. His name was Charles the Hammer Martel. Though violent, he was a great light, and they defeated the Muslims at the Battle of Tours in 732, and Christianity began to spread. His grandson, Charlemagne, Charles the Great, would unite Europe into one Christian uh, kingdom and called it the Holy Roman Empire. And so Christianity begins to expand to take in all of Europe and Charlemagne, believe it or not, tried to establish public schools everywhere in the empire and require everyone to go who was a child, including females. He tried to build a library in any city that had any size to it at all. So this light began to spread and was spreading in such a place that just 35 years after the Jesus event, the Roman historian Tacitus wrote with in indignation, he was angry, because the Christian movement had spread and gone on so long unstopped. He wrote, this pestilent superstition, though checked for a time being, broke out, broke out afresh, not only in Judea, where this mischief started, but also at Rome, where all manner of horrible and loathsome things pour in and become fashionable. So he saw this, what we see as light, as darkness and superstition spreading. He did see it spreading. And this spreading of Christianity is part of our heritage. The hosts of evil had not been able to quench the Christian faith. For that, we're thankful and are called to celebrate. Things are done on earth that are hideous, that are unbelievable, evil. But still in the darkness, the lights shine. And in that, I believe. Christ is, to me, as important now than ever, perhaps more because we continue in our time of struggle. We struggle between violence and nonviolence. There's a struggle between being, believing in progress or retreating in fear, racism versus inclusiveness. William Howard Taft was asked what he thought about the demise of the League of Nations, and he responded, well, the best things of life get crucified, put in a tomb, but they have this way of coming back on the third day. And so it was that it did come back in a more powerful and larger form in the United Nations. So he said, to be sure, crucifixion and tombs happen, but the light that is shed before and after, the forces of darkness can never Put out. The greatest argument over against any bit of negativity and darkness is simply that the fact that the light happens. Good, big stuff does happen. Good does triumph. And we prove our point by simply saying, look, it happened. It's not a matter of arguments. Is this good? Is this bad? Jesus had a wonderful phrase. He said clearly, in the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. 
Prime Minister Gladstone once said, one example is worth a thousand eloquent arguments. The debate ends when we have an example. We said that people, in fact, uh, the Wright brothers' grandfather wrote a essay that was published about how people, human beings, would never be able to fly. Folks said it to them over and over, people cannot fly. Well, then they flew. Jesus was born in a manger and dying on a cross, distinguished only by the love and humility and service that he had, started to shake the foundations of the Roman world 30 years after his event. The proof of good, of light, is when something wonderful happens. Most people, just a couple of hundred years ago, probably believed that you cannot educate the masses. Only special minds, privileged minds, are worth educating. And so this was taken for granted until Horace Mann in New England did his work as the Secretary of Education, I think, in Massachusetts, as he moved that state toward requiring everybody of a certain age to go to a free public school. And so the argument in a few decades ends. It's been done. Great people, bright people, creative people who came from poor homes were becoming outstanding citizens. And within a few decades, this notion swept across America and became a standard set of policies. Every child should be educated in a free public school. And so it is in Christianity that we don't have to argue that there is a light. The light has come. We've seen it in a lot of people. We saw it in St. Francis. We saw it in our own lives in Mother Teresa. We see it over and over again. It is not a ther theoretical argument. It is a, an accomplished fact. And the only question is how many people will be brave enough to follow those who've already seen the light and conquered the light. Now, I remind people over and over again when I'm in the barber shop, those people who think it's got to get worse and worse, that we have seen since the days of Jesus in Christendom an end of gladiatorial combat, an end of slavery, South Africa, the end of apartheid, the increasing percentage, though we're not there yet, of the income that a man makes is growing with women. The last 20 years, one half of the population that was living in poverty is now above the poverty line. So it grows. And the lives like Jesus, like those we've mentioned, but become central place as role models and the, and the judgment seat on people's character. So once the world gets a good glimpse of someone who is full of light, organizing for peace instead of war, something big happens. Hurricane relief, Sakahatchee, Santa Hatchie, Habitat for Humanity, UMCOR. The light is out and it cannot be extinguished. Stillest, darkest hour is just before the dawn, we say. But we truly believe that. That light is still shining and the darkness will never, ever put it out. It cannot be done. Thanks be to God. As I said, we do not prove the light with arguments and data. But we prove the light simply by pointing to an example. 
Earlier, I had you look at this tiny little bit of land that was Christian, Christendom in the world. And in our lifetime, we have seen it, well, not in our lifetime, but in our lifetime, this is the map. Everything in red is a majority Christian country. It has gone from that little sliver of land around France and Greece to a dominant position, the largest religion in the world. The light shone, the light continues to shine, thanks be to God. Let's pray. O oh God of every age, like all humans, we sometimes hide away from the light. Often we cannot imagine that your grace is possible. Forgive us, loving God. Amen. May the Lord make you recipient of divine light. May God make you a bringer of your light. Every day, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.
Oh, oh, oh. 